Alright, there we go. Here in the bottom right is um, um, a psi squared for, for our wave function. In fact, the way that this is represented, each of these little circles, you can see this little, this little circle moving with this little vector moving in space. Each of these represent the amplitude and the component of your, your wave function that is one of the first eight vibrational states. So this is v equals zero, v equals one, v equals two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right, so right now what's happening, what you're seeing, this is the amplitude of the component that's v equals zero, the ground state. And as you can see, it's the only one that has a component. All right, so what you're seeing here is psi squared for the v equals zero state. Okay, the reason why it's oscillating, of course, is because well, we haven't really talked about time evolution, but we know that these things are complex. So what you're actually watching is the phase of the, of the wave function evolving in complex space here, the, the phase of the, right, because it's a wave, and it's a wave that looks, acts like an electromagnetic wave, which means it has a complex phase, and so you're watching the complex phase of that wave moving. And as you can see, not much is happening to it. You can, if you look really closely, I can probably make it a little more dramatic, you can see it's wiggling a little bit. Let me see if I can speed it up a bit. So I've made it a little more, a little floppier. You can see what happens. This is what the bond does. Right, again, this is, this is kind of, each one of these points is the probability of observing the bond at that length. Okay, so the average bond length, right, most of your observations of the bond length is right here. So this is kind of a, think of this as the measurement of the bond as a function of time. It has an average value and a, st and a width, which is your standard deviation. Right? That's the thing about quantum mechanics is that you have an inherent uncertainty to your measurement. Right? So our measurement of the bond length would give us an average right here in the middle and an error proportional to the width of the standard deviation of this distribution. And you can see it kind of jiggles back and forth. Right? Right? This is the ground state. Right? This is the lowest energy state of the molecule. So this is, this is what the bond does when it has no energy, when it has minimum energy. It's a cold bond ground state, right? It, uh, it wiggles a little bit, right? Because remember, it has a little bit of energy. One half h bar omega has that zero point energy. And because it has a little bit of energy, it does has a little bit of net momentum, p squared. And so therefore the system oscillates a little bit, right? So every bond wiggles, no matter what. Even if there's no zero Kelvin, but even if there were a zero Kelvin, something asymptotically close to zero Kelvin, the bond is still doing this. It's always wiggling. All right, so let's see what happens when I kick the energy up a little bit, right? I'm gonna excite my bond with a photon, right? I'm gonna make it absorb some energy with light and I'm gonna excite it to a, a higher state. So let's kick this one on. All right, what happens here? Well, remember in in the, in the V equals one, let me minimize it. Let me just move this over a little bit so we can look at the plot. There's a node in the middle, right? If I take the square of this, this goes positive, this is positive. I haven't drawn it very well, but there's a node in the middle, right? And so when we make measurements in time of this bond, we'll see it at two different extents, right? So this is the average that we saw for V equals zero, right in the middle, right, right here. Now the bond can't exist at those limits. So now when, when you observe the bond, it oscillates back and forth between these two maxima, right? So you get a bimodal distribution for the bond. Sometimes it's a little shorter, sometimes it's a little bit longer. Now when you take an average, and I measure this over many periods, I still get an average right in the middle, right? But, my, but obviously that, that average only tells you so much because you have a bimodal distribution so you actually you have a much larger standard deviation because you're, you have two distributions you're averaging over and they're very wide. So what this looks like, again, you have roughly the same average as before, but now the system is oscillating between two limits that is a much bigger displacement than V equals one, right? V equals one was just one of these moving like this, right? And now the bond is moving like this between these two in time. Right? This gives you a sense of what the motion looks like for these, these bonds, right? It doesn't look like 
a normal thing wiggling back and forth, right? Because we can only make single observations at a time. But the fact of the matter is, is you think about every time you make those observations and you watch it move, it doesn't move like this, but it moves like this. Right? It's a bigger displacement. All right, let's just keep going up. Now I have two, I'm gonna turn that off. Let me just zero it out. All right, and now for V equals three, or V equals two rather, we have the same thing. But now we have a node, we have two nodes and there's a region in the middle, so now the system is oscillating between these three points on average. All right, so the, the, you can think about the weight, the, the motion of this becomes more and more complicated. But the end result is, is that the average displacement from the center, how much it actually stretches, the maximum extent of the stretch, if you will, gets larger and larger as you go up in energy. And that should make sense. The more energy you put into the bond, on average, it stretches more. But because the bond is wave-like, it doesn't just simply stretch and, and start to move back and forth like this, like a, like a mass would. Right? Instead, it's a wave. And you have amplitudes like this, and it alternates between those amplitudes. All right, you'll never see the bond here or here. But you'll see it oscillate between these three peaks like this. You'll see the colors move through it in phase. All right, but this doesn't look, so here's the, here's the thing. This doesn't look like a mass on a spring. Right? Classically, what happens to a mass on a spring? If we start here on this turning point where it's fully extended, remember it goes, it oscillates smoothly back and forth. Right? That's what a slinky, a mass on a slinky does. It oscillates back and forth smoothly. Right? So if we have it here, you could think if we had, if you could represent psi squared for your mass, what's the probability distribution of where your mass is as a function of the, of the motion of the spring? In a classical system, it moves like this, back and forth. But that's obviously not what we see quantum mechanically. Quantum mechanically, we see oscillations between probability densities like this in time. Right? It's got this weird wave-like behavior, nodal-like structure. So the question you may ask is, how can we make a quantum mechanical oscillator, right? think about a bond, how can we make it move smoothly like this? To, to simulate the same motion that you have on a spring. And the fact of the matter is, is that because we've set our, the way we've represented our system, is in states of con constant energy, right, we lose that information. So in order for us to create a quantum harmonic oscillator that moves like a mass on a spring, smoothly back and forth between the limits, we can't do it in, with a single energy because the wave functions for the single energies give us motion that looks like this. Right? It's moving like a wave. Right, wave-like behavior. So what if we want to give it particle-like behavior? Well, it turns out that in order to do that, we have to get rid of the wave-like properties. Well, what's a wave-like property? A wave-like property, a wave-like system has a single frequency or a sum of different frequencies. But a, a, a system that has definite motion and position moving like this doesn't act like a wave anymore. It acts like a particle, and therefore it has to have multiple frequencies. All right, we'll, 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 we'll prove this soon. But the equivalent, you can create, and people can do this in, in, in labs. It's not that hard to do. You can create what's called a coherent state, which is a, which is a quantum harmonic oscillator, say a bond, that moves classically, as classically as you can think of, where the, dent, the probability moves smoothly across the limits. All right, it's called a coherent state. And this is what it looks like. Right, this is exactly what you would expect a classical harmonic oscillator to do, right? This is the motion of the atom bouncing back and forth between the turning points. All right, in order to have a wave function that represents this motion in time, your particle actually has all of the energies. It's not just one state, it's a sum of all of the states, energy states. All right, and, and again, this is this is the the, the important thing that we're doing here is that what we're, by localizing this particle in this way, we're making a very definite statement about the position of the bond at a given moment, right? I can say at this very moment, 
the atom, the bond is really short, and then it goes smoothly to the long, right? I'm making a statement about information regarding its position, right? It's not completely delocalized like a wave, whereas humps and troughs and nodes, this is a particle or particle-like density moving back and forth through space. I'm making a very, very definite statement about its position. And what we'll learn, this is, and I, I'm surprised I haven't introduced this yet, but this might be a good time soon to do it. Actually, I think we'll do it around very, and maybe next class. Is that because I'm defining, I'm making a measurement of the exact position of my bond, I lose information about its momentum. All right, remember energy is proportional momentum squared. So if I know something about its position, if I make a measurement about the bond's position as a function of time, I lose information about its energy as a function of time. So what's the result of that? Well, that means that a wave function that has defined position has undefined energy. Right? So, a, so a quantum particle that moves like a classical particle is one that actually has multiple frequencies and multiple energies together. All right, maybe a nice way to look at this is to look at the real and a mat. Oh, maybe that's not what I want to do. Yeah, that just confuses you. So uh, that just confuses you. All right, so this is, this is a consequence of the same principle of why when we learn about flavor, we lose color and vice versa. Right? This is between momentum and position. And you know that when you have a definite position, you know the position definitely for your system, you lose information about its momentum and vice versa. In our Schrodinger solution, we know exactly what the, mo what the momentum squared of our particle is because we fixed the energy. Right? Remember, remember, energy is proportional to P squared over 2M, kinetic energy. So if we have a fixed kinetic energy, then we have a fixed p squared, fixed magnitude of our momentum, fixed velocity, if you will. And because we've defined our momentum, or because we've defined our momentum exactly in the Schrodinger equation, we have defined p squared states, magnitude of momentum, we don't know anything about the position. Right? The position of the system is completely delocalized. Right, we can only know something about its probability, but it can be anywhere in the space. Right? This is the opposite limit. Here we know exactly where it is in space, and therefore we lose information about its energy, or its momentum squared. Right? Momentum and position are also incompatible measurements, in the same way color and flavor are for our electrons. Right? We'll formalize that. All right? There's a postulate that allows us to formalize that. Not really ready to do it yet, because right? it's not a very useful tool yet for us. Um, well, we, when we get to spin, it will become very important. Right? When we talk about hydrogen atoms, it will become important, and then we'll introduce it. We'll formalize this idea. <coughs> right, so it's important to think of that, is that when we solve things for short, when we create our system that where it has fixed energies, we lose information about the position, and vice versa. We have posi fixed positions, we lose information about the energy. Again, you can create harmonic oscillators to do either of these things, right? It doesn't, these are both solutions. These are both solutions to the same Schrodinger equation. We're just doing slightly different representations of the molecule, the bond. This is fixed energy representation of the bond, and this is a fixed position representation of the bond, right? Fixed momentum versus fixed position, right? They give us different results. They're equivalent, but are, we can't measure them simultaneously, so they look differently to both to us. Uh, any questions about this? Okay. This is a nice example. So when you go when you go measure a bond with spectroscopy, you're you're interrogating these levels. So when you measure the energy levels of your vibrations, you don't really know what the bond is physically doing. You can only measure an average, right? Which is this psi squared, right? But if we were going to track the bond, right? We're going to track the atom as a function of time its exact position with respect to the other one, then we'll lose information about its energy. Okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit really quickly. I want to, I want to look at uh, a couple of different things today. 
So the first thing I want to talk about again is about this, this bell curve like behavior. So let's go back. Let's go back to my V equals zero state. And I'm going to draw, just kind of zoom in my potential like this. There's my potential kind of poorly drawn, but that's okay. And I'll draw my little wave function there. Uh, let me let me let me clean this up a little bit. So the function, let me uh, draw a little line here just to just to localize myself. So we'll call this x naught. That's the center of the potential. And let me just make sure I get the curvature right. There we go. That's a little better. Something like that. Okay, this is my size here. And in fact, we'll do psi zero squared. The reason why, so here's a really nice, here's the first thing about, about these Gaussian functions that are really nice, is if our wave function for zero is proportional to the exponent e to the minus alpha x squared over two, what's psi squared for this? Well, it's not too hard to calculate that. This is the same as psi zero times psi zero Right? And the product of two Gaussians is a Gaussian. Right? So psi squared basically looks the same as psi. That's really nice. Right? Obviously, when we add the x and the x squared to it, the Hermite polynomial that kind of falls apart because they're orthogonal. But for here, it's really nice to get that the psi squared is basically just two times, the exponent is just double what it was before. All right, and so what I want to think about today, all right, and remember, so how do we do integrals for this, for instance? Like, for instance, if we wanted to measure the average value of x, how would we do that? Well, we do it just like we do for the particle in the box. We take the wave function squared and multiply it by x. So let me get the numbers right. So this is the integral. And what do we have to integrate between? Well, the function is defined across infinity. So this is minus infinity to infinity. Is that uh, supposed to be psi? What is the first psi supposed to be psi subscript? Is that supposed to be v or zero? Zero. V equals zero. All right. Is that for all of them too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're only looking at v equals zero here. So what's psi here? I wrote it down before. I'll just rewrite it. It's it's got a normalization constant alpha over pi to the one fourth power e to the minus alpha x squared over two All right and of course we're going to multiply that by the operator x our average position and we have the same thing on the other side because the wave function is real we don't have to worry about complex numbers This is how we would measure that average value of x for the v equals zero state. Let me write that, v equals zero. All right, so how does this integral work out? Well, we get a square root of alpha over pi on the outside. The integral from minus pi, or minus infinity to positive infinity of x and then we have two factors of the Gaussian, so that's e to the minus alpha x squared dx. All right, well, this is a tricky integral to do. By the way, if you type this into Wolfram Alpha, it'll do it. So it might not be immediately obvious to you how to, how to integrate this. You can do it by parts. And in fact, I will write down on the side, eventually you'll get an integral once you do it by parts. I'm never going to make you do it by parts, but I'll just write this on the side. Really, really helpful. The integral from negative infinity to infinity of just the alpha x squared part has a really, really simple closed form, pi over alpha. 
Okay, so you could certainly do by parts and get, and get another integral on the other side to get rid of the x. And then you'll end up having the integral of e to the minus alpha x squared where you're going to plug in pi over alpha. Right? And you can kind of imagine, right, you can kind of see why now that the function, the normalization constant is proportional to alpha over pi square root because the integral is equal to pi, the square root of pi over alpha proportional to that, right? So we've got to cancel that out. We want to integrate the 1. So if the integral of e to the minus alpha x squared is square root of pi over alpha, then we're probably going to want an alpha over pi square root in our wave function to normalize it, right? So that's where that comes from. But it turns out that formulas, integrals of functions of x times a Gaussian, these are really well known. You can calculate them for any power of x. Right, and I'll, I'll make, I have a, there's a sheet of common integrals on the, on, on canvas with this information, but I'll write it down for you. All right, so we want to figure out how to calculate this. And, and again, I don't want you to, to pull your hair out of integration by parts because these integrals are so well known. They've been studied for hundreds of years. We might as well use all the information about them. I'm just going to make this box a little smaller. All right, and so let me write down the formulas for these integrals, all right? And then every problem you pretty much have to do in this class will be one of these integrals for harmonic oscillators. They're just such nice formulas. All right, and there's two different classes of formulas for the, these x to the n times a Gaussian integrals, these x times e to the minus alpha x squared. There's two of them. All right, so we have two, two formulas, all right, for the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n e to the minus alpha x squared dx. Okay, so wherever n is is a number, zero through zero through infinity. N is an integer. Uh, I was about to use some mathematical notation. I won't. Okay, so there are two cases. One is n odd. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, one, sorry, one, three, five, seven, and so on. Uh, let me write it like this, actually. So let me write it x to the k. I'll tell you why in a second. k is an integer. So this is going to be k odd, which means that I'm just going to rewrite this. We can say k an odd number can always be represented as 2n plus 1 for an integer n. All right, so for an odd value of k, negative in, the integral of negative from a negative infinity to infinity of x to the 2n plus 1 times e to the minus alpha x squared dx. Really, really simple formula n factorial divided by 2 times alpha to the n minus 1 power. God, it can't get any easier than that. Okay, so for so for our this is actually the case for our integral above, right? Our integral here is x to the 1, so n is 0, right? Cuz 1's an odd number. 1 is equal to 2n plus 1. n has to be 0. Right, so for, I'll just write this for uh, k equals 1. That integral is equal to 0 factorial over 2 times alpha to the minus 1, which is alpha over 2. Right, because 0 factorial is 1. All right, so you have alpha to the minus 1, that's alpha. 0 factorial is 1, so you have alpha times 1 half, which is alpha over 2. Okay. There's one more formula, which is for k even. This one's a little more complicated, but we'll walk through it. So k is equal to 2 times n for some integer n. The integral of minus infinity to infinity of x to the 2n 
e to the minus alpha x squared dx. It's a little more complicated. It's the double factorial of 2n minus 1. So that means you take the factorial of that number and then you take the factorial of the result. We'll work, we'll work it out for an example in a second. All right? Divided by uh, alpha to the n times 2n plus 1 times pi, the square root of pi over alpha. All right, kind of a complicated formula. Okay, um, but let's work through an example really quickly. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a new page, but I'll just leave these up. So I'll just, I'll just scroll it over so you guys can keep writing. Is that supposed to be uh, parenthesis 2n minus 1 double factorial? Yes, double factorial. All right, so let's, let's just do an example of this just so you understand what a double factorial is. It's not that hard to, to understand. All right, so let's, let's, let, so let's think about the integral. So an example of this is the integral of x squared e to the minus alpha x squared dx from negative infinity to infinity. All right, so here n is 1, right, because k is 2, k is equal to 2n, so n is 1. All right, so here n is equal to 1. So, the inter so what do we have? We have the integral, we have the 2n minus 1 double factorial, one, 2 is, sorry, n is 1, so that's 2 times 1 minus 1, that's 1 double factorial. We'll evaluate that in a second. And now it's alpha to the 1 times 2 to the 2, because n is 1, times the square root of pi over alpha. OK, how do we evaluate one double factorial? Well, first we take one factorial, right? One factorial, and then we take the factorial of that over 4 alpha times the square root of pi over alpha. 1 factorial is 1 times, is just 1. And then 1 factorial of 1 factorial is 1 factorial, which is 1. So this is 1 over 4 alpha pi over alpha. Okay? And let's, let's just do another example, right, for a different n. Let's do n equals 4, or sorry, 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 at k equals 4. So x to the fourth, e to the minus alpha x squared dx from infinity to negative infinity. Right, so that's going to be, so k, n here is 2. So we have 2 double factorial. divided by alpha to the 2 times 2 to the 3 third power times pi over alpha. What's 2 factorial? It's 2 times 1. That's 2. So it's going to be 2 factorial again. Alpha squared times 8 times pi over alpha. And of course, two factorial is just two. So I can just get rid of the plus sign here. Okay? And so just as an example, we'll do something a little harder. Three double factorial, just as an example, would be three factorial, then factorial, which three times two times one, that's six factorial, which is six times five times four times three times two times one which is 30, 120 times 3, 360 times 2, 640. All right, so that number gets pretty big pretty quickly. <laughs> All right, so that's, the, that's an example of double factorial. Double factorial is just taking the factorial of a factorial. Almost every form, uh, integral that you do for harmonic oscillators will look like this. We'll look at some x to some power times a Gaussian. Okay, so these are really nice formula to have. Again, Gauss, Wolfram Alpha, 
and pretty much any like modern calculator knows these formula because they're they're used everywhere. They're used in statistics. They're used in physics. They're used in mathematics. They're used in chemistry, obviously. Uh, bell curves are very useful for people. They're used in heat transfer and engineering, right? So these integrals are well known, all right? But they're not one that you typically see in a calculus class. Okay, and again, you can see that, that everything's got this pi over alpha dependency squared, pi over alpha dependency, right? This is why that normalization constant's alpha over pi. We want to cancel that out. Uh, and just as a reminder here, alpha is just a number. Okay, just a number. It can be any number. Okay, super easy. You guys lose these, you can look them up online. Wikipedia literally has all these Gaussian integrals. Type in Gaussian integral on Wikipedia, it'll give you a whole list of them. You can integrate all sorts of things with a Gaussian next to it. You convolute a Gaussian into any function. There's, sometimes it can make that function integrable. And this is one of those cases. Okay, so that, that's enough kind of boring, boring math. I want to uh, kind of get back to what I promised to talk about today which was the failures. What, what's wrong with this harmonic oscillator approximation for a bond? So let's go back and look at our potential. Again, let's look at our potential again. And we have some bond length R, we'll call it R, we'll call it, I've been using X naught, all right? We'll use that again. All right, we have some standard bond length X naught, right? This is our average bond length, right? This is the bond length that sits in the middle. Uh, by the way, I, 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 sorry, I wanna, I, I, I don't mean to jump too much. I never solved this question. What's the average bond length for a, for the V equals zero? Well, it's just X naught. As you'll find, as you can find out, you'll you'll do this calculation on the homework, so I'll let you work it out. But it's just like the particle in the box, right? The the bond is generally an average right in the middle, so it'll it'll basically give you x naught. That's how that math works out. Okay, so. What, let's think of a typical bond, right? What if this is a CH bond, right? If this is a CH bond, single bond, well, obviously single bond, X naught is around 1.5 angstroms. Okay? So this number is a, a, a positive small bond number, but it's a number, right? But what is this potential defined on? And so the center of this potential is 1.5 angstroms, right? And I can take that bond and I can compress it to negative infinity and I can extend it to positive infinity. But what happens at those limits in a harmonic oscillator? Well, I can keep going up this potential. Eventually, I'm going to hit R equals zero, right? Somewhere along this coordinate, along x, I'm going to hit a point r equals 0. Right, so let's put 0 like right here. Right, and the fact of the matter is, is that 0 angstroms, the system has a small and finite energy. Right, but what does zero angstroms mean for a bond length? Well, that means that our two atoms, our C and our H atoms, are, the nuclei are literally right on top of each other. The atoms are pressing against, are literally on top of each other. In fact, once you get to within, you know, an angstrom or so, your, the, the, the electron cloud of one of your atoms is starting to impinge on the other. Right, but the fact of the matter is, is that the harmonic potential just lets you just keep going. And then you have to ask the question, well, if I go any smaller than zero angstroms, now I'm negative. What's a negative distance? Well, what's happened now is that if, 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 you, if you think about it like this, your bond here 
where the H is on the right and the C is on the left, this is R positive. Or sorry, rather, yeah, R positive. And having the C on the opposite side, this is R negative. Right, but what have I done? Right, so if R is R X, sorry, I mean X here. So again, I can extend this bond to negative infinity. That just means that the atoms have switched sides. But again, I've, I've passed through this point in order to get from positive to negative, right? In order to switch from this limit to this limit, those two atoms have to go through each other. But atoms don't do that, right? They repel each other, right? If you have two nuclei right on top of each other, right? You have protons and lots of protons and more protons. They're going to press against each other. You bring the electron clouds together too close, they're going to press against, they're going to push each other apart because electrons repel each other. Right? So, but this tells me that I move through this limit smoothly and without any drama. Well, that's not a good thing. Right? That's clearly unphysical. Right? This, this predicts. Right? So one conclusion is, is that uh, passing through x equals zero, which is where you have the carbon atom and the hydrogen atom right on top of each other, uh, happens drama three, free. Right? It's obviously not going to be drama free. Right? We haven't considered the fact that the nuclei will repel each other, much less the electrons will repel each other before the nuclei are even close. Remember, the nuclear nuclear part of an atom is tiny. Right? It's about a factor of the radius of the of the the proton is something like a thousand times smaller than the average distance between the proton and the electron in the hydrogen atom. So the, the, pro, the nucleus is a very, very small point. But so there's going to be this big range that's positive, you know, like 0.2 angstroms, 0.3 angstroms, something like that, where you're just, the electron clouds are right on top of each other. And they're just going to press apart. But you don't see that here because if I go to the opposite limit on the other side, If I displace my, my bond the same direction the opposite way, which would be three angstroms, it says I have the same, the same potential energy as I do on the other side, where it's at zero angstroms. That's obviously not true, right? Because this should be very, very high energy. And in fact, this should be way lower energy than before because the atoms are not only close, not, they're not close to each other, they're even further apart. They interact even less than they do when they're close together. Right, so the, the negative, the, the small bond length limit of this is wrong, but also the maximum bond length limit, the, the, the high bond length limit is wrong too. Right, it says that putting these atoms at three angstroms is the same energy as zero angstroms. Definitely not true, we'll see that, why? You can just kind of think of that though, that they clearly are different environments. Even more, what does this say about my bond as I go to infinite distance, right? What are my energy levels? Well, remember my energy levels, maybe this is V equals zero, we'll just say. And there's a level V equals one. And I'm just climbing up, I go to another one, V equals three. And no matter what I do, these are all H bar omega apart, Right? There's just, and, and, and how far does this, this energy rung ladder continue? It continues forever. Right? I can just keep putting more and more energy into my system. And the system is still bound. Right? There's an infinite number of bound states in my bond. So what I could do is I could extend, I could put so much energy into my, my bond, I could put macroscopic amounts of energy into my bond. And a harmonic oscillator potential would say, you're still bound, you're still vibrating, the atoms are still touching each other and they're acting is that exactly the way that you would expect them to in this system. But we know that's not true. Because if you take two atoms and you put energy into them and pull them apart, what happens? The bond breaks, right? What, what does that mean? That means eventually you put so much energy into your molecule that there are no more bound states of the bond. You now have two individual atoms that aren't connected anymore, right? Well, that doesn't predict that. 
right? This predicts that the molecule is bound for any position, any length of the bond. Right? Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, sorry. That that means bond length. I mean x here. Thank you for asking. Is it for the first conclusion, or is this passing through x equals zero? What is that supposed? Uh, that's to be? a carbon and a hydrogen atom oh, on top of each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not a very good drawing of that, but that's what I'm getting at. And so the other thing is, is that um, the bond never breaks. Okay, so we've, learnt, we've lost two critical pieces of information about our system, about a physical system, which is that the bond, that the atoms don't repel each other when they're close together and that when you pull them apart, it never breaks. You just go to a higher and higher vibrational state. Right? This parabola continues on for infinity. There's no breaking point. I mean, it's infinitely tall in that sense, right? So obviously what that means is that there are physical limits that where the harmonic oscillator breaks down, at the short limit and at the long limit. Okay, so what do we think Let's think a little bit about what we would what we would imagine the actual potential for the diatomic bond would look like. So let's let's start to think about that a little bit. Um, where am I going to put it? I am going to rewrite these down here. So x equals zero is drama free, and bond never breaks. All right, those are our two problems. Now I'll clean that text up. I'm just going to erase this because I need a little space. All right, so let me draw a big fat coordinate system. And we'll plot, oops, sorry. We'll plot, as again before, we'll plot, damn it. We'll plot energy, V of X, Right, which is the potential energy of the bond versus its length. Right, and we'll choose, let's choose a length on our on our plot where the energy is minimum. Right, this is our x naught. Okay, and what I'm going to do is now let's think about what happens as we start to displace our bond away from x naught physically. Okay for a real bond, All right? So let's use a little chemical intuition for this. And think about what the limits of these things are, okay? What happens at x equals zero and what happens at x equals infinity, okay? And then let's see if we can try to draw a sketch, an idea of what the potential looks like, given its limits of the edges. So we know that x naught, we can start there. We know it's a minimum, All right? It's an energetic minimum and so if it's an energetic minimum, it has to look like a parabola near the bottom. Okay, because a line does not have a minimum, right? There's no derivative of a line that gives you zero. So the smallest fun polynomial function that gives you an actual minimum is a quadratic function. So we know that the bottom of the potential looks like a quadratic, has to. It's the old simplest function that gives us the property we want of a minimum. All right, and so the question now, of course, is what happens as x goes to infinity? Well, that means we're stretching the bond further and further and further, right? Obviously, it takes some energy to break a bond, right? It takes about 400 kilojoules per mole to break a carbon-hydrogen bond. So we know that as we go up this way, the energy is going to increase. But what's the limit as x goes to infinity? Well, that means that the atoms are infinitely far apart. They're not interacting anymore. So if I move them a little bit at long distance, it doesn't change the energy at all because they don't talk to each other. So we know that at long distance, you have a flat line in your energy. Right? It has to reach some asymptotic limit 
because the atoms get so far apart that they don't—they're neither attracted nor repelled by each other. Right? They're just individual atoms moving away from each other. There's no energy change. They're free particles. All right. So we know it at, at infinity, it goes to the flat line. And what about as it goes to x equals zero? Right? When the atoms start to converge with each other. Well, it's probably not perfectly infinite. Because, and in fact, the atoms, there might be some probability the atoms can move through each other because, in fact, the matter is nuclei are pretty small. But the energy cost has to be massive. So let's just make an assumption that the energy goes to infinity as x goes to zero, right? It's impossible for the atoms to overlap each other. Let's just make that assumption. I think that's a fair one. So the, the low side of this should basically just asymptotically go up like this really, really fast, right? Because that, that's what's happening as you're starting to get the atoms closer and closer together. The electrons start to repel each other. Then the nuclei start to repel each other, right? That's really energetically costly, right? And the whole thing needs to be smooth, okay? So we just have to fill in the gap. So we've gone from a, a, a function that has positive curvature here and it needs to smoothly vary into a flat line that's horizontal. So there's really only one way to draw this, which is that it starts to bow out like this and you have an inflection point, like that. Okay, so this looks maybe a more reasonable approximation for a potential. It gives us the low side that we want, and it gives us the behavior of what a bond does when we stretch it all the way. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Remember that I said that the simplest, right? Remember, the whole point is it has to be a smooth, continuous function, all right? That's what we call analytic. What that means is that you can approximate the function locally by a polynomial. And the simplest polynomial that gives you a minimum is a quadratic. So this part right here, really close to the minimum, looks just like a parabola, right? So let me fit a parabola here. All right, so here's my little parabola in blue. Right, and this is just a right. What all? What is all a parabola? Well, this is just. 1 half kx squared. Okay? So, in our real atomic, in our real molecular potential, this is a diatomic, remember it's just diatomic. The nearby region near the bottom of the well looks like a harmonic oscillator. Right? Right down here, nearest the smallest displacements possible, the minimal displacements of the bond are very harmonic-like. Right? But then as we start to get towards the edges, we become less harmonic, right? The thing starts to bow away or starts to grow even faster. In fact, I, I drew this a little incorrectly. So on the lower side, I just want to draw this. This grows faster than the parabola, so the parabola should actually go like this instead. Like that. There we go. Something like that. Okay. So in this region right here, the energy levels and the and the and the bond are very very harmonic, right? But as you start to get closer to the, this limit here, right, you get less harmonic behavior, right? But just like this, we can still define energy levels, right? So our harmonic energy levels, like this, right? So this system still has energy levels, right? But as and so for like so for instance for v equals 0 this energy level that you would predict from the harmonic oscillator right the potential looks just like the actual the yellow potential the actual molecular potential and so this v equals 0 state is very harmonic like right these ground sta states inside the actual molecular potential look like a harmonic oscillator but as you can see, right, so, the, so this state, I'll, I'll kind of just kind of mark in purple here, right? But as I continue going up in energy, you can see the potential starts to disagree more and more and more, okay? And 
so as we get to higher and higher energy, our system becomes less and less harmonic. All right, what I'm going to introduce now is this, this magic potential. All right, so this is, this is the point that I, this is kind of the take home point once I introduce this is that the harmonic oscillator is a good approximation for small displacements or vibrations, whichever way you want to think about it, or uh, states with small v, right, the small v. And what we'll show is that um, the, uh, let me write this, the more rigid the bond, which means high value of K, the force constant, the more appropriate the harmonic oscillator is as an approximation. All right, so for very, very stiff bonds, things like really, really strong bonds, things like a CH bond, for instance, for a CH bond, which again has a very, very strong constant, it's very, very stiff, and also has a very small mass, so the frequency omega is very high, it's also a very strong bond, it takes 400 kilojoules a mole to break it apart, the harmonic oscillator is a very good approximation of some of the lower energy levels. In fact, when we go make, and we'll, we'll do this next class, we'll look at these approximations. We'll, we'll make some, we'll look, do some experiments and look at our predictions versus experiment. And we'll find that for, for kind of traditional covalent bonds, strong covalent bonds, stretches and things, things of high frequencies, stiff motions, the harmonic oscillator is a very good approximation because the, this, this yellow potential is very, very deep and very, very sharp. It's not kind of floppy. It's very, very narrow and sharp. It looks a lot like a parabola for a long part of the energy. Right? But imagine that this bond is very floppy and very weak. Let me compare. Let me, let me draw two different examples. So imagine we have a strong bond and a weak bond. Right? If we have a strong bond and it's a very rigid bond, what does the potential look like? Well, it's very, very, it's very, very deep and it takes a lot of energy to break. So it might look like that, right? So if I were to try to fit a parabola near the b bottom of the well, it looks a lot like a parabola until a lot farther along. All right, so there's a number of energy levels inside of this parabola, or inside of this potential, that look very harmonic. All right, because the potential looks very parabolic until you get to very high energy. But if you have a weak bond, your potential is very shallow and also quite broad like this, like this. So the gap between the bottom of the well and this association limit and the weak bond is much closer. And also the width of the well is also kind of sh more shallow and broader, right? And so if you were to draw a parabola to approximate this function, it would start to disagree rapidly. Right? And so if I were to draw my energy levels, and we'll see this comparative soon, they start the wave functions and the wave energy start to disagree dramatically with the actual values that we see for a molecule. Right? This is what the potential looks like experimentally in yellow. Right? That's what the energy looks like for our system. And so the, the harmonic oscillator is only an approximation. 
So it's a good approximation, especially for strong bonds, and we can learn a lot of quantitative information from it. But the, but the fact of the matter is, is that on the edges, where chemistry starts to happen, either you break a bond or you have repulsions, right? When physics starts to kick in, the harmonic oscillator falls apart. It doesn't work. So it's only for that region where things are well behaved. Right? And so the question, of course, is, is how good is this approximation? Right? Experimentally. Because I could say this all we want, but we have to look at numbers to know if this is good or not. Right? Um, which I don't have time for today. We'll do this next class. Um, but this is something for you to think about. Is that the harmonic oscillator is only what I would call a local approximation. Right? It's good around the minimum energy. But it'll start to fail as we go up in higher and higher energy. And the weaker the bond is, the faster it starts to fail. All right, so what we'll do next class is we'll go look at actual data. All right, we'll go do infrared spectroscopy and ask the question, how fast does the harmonic oscillator fail? And what if we, can, if we instead of using the harmonic oscillator, we use an approximative function that gives us this behavior, the correct behavior, if we use a new potential function that looks more like the real potential, can we come up with a way to correct our harmonic oscillator predictions for the problems? Like, can we use a new model to correct the issues? And the answer is yes. Okay, so we'll look at that next class. Okay. Have a lovely weekend. I've off I will have office hours tomorrow at 1130. I'll, I'll make a note. They will be in Buckman 311, not in my office. So if you plan on coming, I'll be in the PCHEM lab tomorrow morning. Otherwise, have a good weekend.